Thank you very much, Drew. Uh, as Drew said, I want to give some shout outs to four organizations that I'm associated with. So the Meetup uh, Data Science DC that I helped run and Data Community DC, which is our, our backing organization, my employer, and uh, also NYC Data Mafia, which is a t-shirt I once bought. Um, so I want to talk about a problem in the world of data science, uh, the problem of definition. It's kind of a, a vacuous term, and as a consequence, a lot of people get hung up on it uh, and try to do things like post Venn diagrams in their blogs about <laughs> what it actually means. Uh, I'm not actually going to try and define data science per se today. I instead want to focus on a consequence of this lack of definition, uh, which is that it impacts communication about what we actually do and who is actually doing it. So today I'm going to talk about this communication issue, about a survey that I did with uh, Mark Feisman and Sean Murphy, and I'm going to share some early ideas on how improving definitions uh, could improve our ability to effectively deliver value from data. So you don't need me to tell you that in many ways we're doing great. So job growth in recent years has been tremendous. You could literally spend your entire year at data science and big data conferences and get exactly no work done. Uh, VCs are throwing money at uh, big data startups. Academics are seeing huge amounts of interest in applied statistics, machine learning, and other fields. So that's great. Uh, but there are some growing pains, and here's the problem as I see it. Uh, so data science, big data, predictive analytics are in many ways the result of what I'm going to call a buzzword meat grinder. So in the past, we had some perfectly good definitions uh, of, uh, of what people do, of academic departments, of career paths. And, uh, but because of this recent change in buzzwords, we've, we've lost a lot of that clarity. It's no longer clear what, in fact, uh, who knows what and who does what and what you as a data scientist uh, could do about your own career and where you could go from where you are now. So we've got unclear definitions. And uh, what does this lead to? This leads to unclear conversations, unclear expectations, and lost opportunities. This is important. The uh, philosopher Paul Grice uh, provided a series of maxims that described how good communication ought to work if it's to be effective. And if we're ambiguous or obscure uh, when we talk about what we do and what we offer, we're just wasting time and flapping our jaws. So let me give you just one example among many of how a lack of definition caused a failure of communication and uh, in turn caused a waste of time and money. So a friend of mine, a data scientist with an engineering degree and an MBA uh, and a number of years of experience helping firms get value out of big data sets, um, was on the job market and he got an interview with a major West Coast firm that knows a thing or two about uh, data science. And after flying in, it became clear right away that there was a, a large mismatch in expectations. Uh, so one of the first questions was to explain how B trees are implemented and how it affects database performance. Uh, so, you know, it, what it turns out the firm actually needed was a software engineer with hardcore database expertise who knew something about stats as well. Uh, but the friend had a totally different set of strengths and uh, had to sit through a very painful interview process. And so the end result of this was wasted time, wasted money, no insights, no value at it. So uh, earlier this, this spring, Mark and Sean and I uh, were sitting around talking about this sort of issue and other examples and decided we wanted to do something about it. So what were our options? Well, we could write another blog post. We could speculate rampantly at the bar. Uh, but no, no, we're data scientists. We're not data speculators or data bloggers. Uh, so we said, let's get some data. And so we crafted a survey that focused on things that we thought were relevant to this issue of clarity and communication about, uh, about the field or fields. Other people have done other types of surveys about other aspects of data science and analytics. Uh, a lot of them have been really great. Uh, but for our purposes, we didn't ask and we don't care about things like whether you work in Python or R or something else. We don't care what sector you work in, how much you're paid, and we really seriously don't care about your favorite database platform. Um, instead, we ask questions to give us some insights into introspective matters. How do you think about your skills? How do you think about your career? Uh, and what other things have you done with your life, in your life? So we wrote questions about five types of things. I'm going to focus on the first two, skills and self-identification, and talk quickly about experiences and education. For uninteresting reasons, I'm not going to talk about web presence. 
And we constructed this survey, sent links out to all of our friends, our colleagues. We posted on discussion boards, posted on Twitter, evangelized to meetups. If you didn't see it, we did something wrong. Um, and we did reasonably well. We got hundreds of responses, many from people we didn't even know. Um, and so our next step was to figure out a plan of analysis and what we wanted to do with this data. So we had three goals. The first goal is that we wanted to get some interesting uh, insights by comparing relevant subgroups. I found in my experience that looking at marginal data from this sort of thing is rarely as interesting as uh, looking at the exceptions and the interactions uh, of, of, of uh, subgroups of the data. Uh, secondly, we wanted to highlight issues of variety and the assortment uh, in the population that we surveyed. And third, we wanted to look at our results in the context of our problem. So can we use this data to help improve how we communicate uh, about the work that we do? So the first set of questions was about skills. Uh, we created a list of 22 skills that we thought covered the distinctive and useful types of things that, that uh, a data scientist might be able to do. Things like uh, Bayesian statistics, uh, product development, math, uh, data manipulation, data visualization, and so forth. And we had sort of a drag and drop operation where you drag things from the left and put them on the right, putting your best skill at the top and your weakest skill at the bottom. Uh, it's worth mentioning why we used ranking here rather than something else. A simple approach would have been to use rating scales of some sort, like uh, expert, experienced, familiar, unfamiliar. The problem is it's very difficult for people how to calibrate their responses to something they're kind of middling at um, uh, to, to each other, and different people tend to do so in different ways. Uh, so for our analysis, we used these rankings instead, and we got data that was good enough for our purposes. And uh, it was also, this was kind of fun to do. It's a nice bit of introspection to try and say, okay, am I better at classical statistics or science or something like that? Um, so we looked at the rankings that we got out of this data and, and decided that the first thing we wanted to do was to reduce the set of 22 skills into a more, uh, uh, an easier number of, of skill clusters uh, that, that tend to correlate. And I ended up using non-negative matrix factorization to do this. There are other approaches that might work, um, but we like the intuition that we're finding some underlying structure in the ranking response pattern. So we're finding sets of skills that people rank together. That is, they tended to rank them all high or to rank them all low. Here are the five latent factors that we found. Uh, each factor, or I'm gonna call them skill groups for this presentation, uh, we labeled with something that we sort of covered the, the individual skills in that group. Um, and so for each of these five skill groups, I'm giving the skill, or I'm putting the skill in the group that it was most heavily associated with. So from the top, programming uh, and running systems falls under the programming group. Statistics also includes things like uh, data munging and science and visualization. The math OR category uh, includes CS theory, Bayesian statistics, and the skills involved in operations research. Business includes product development. And the last category uh, includes big data, machine learning, and things like SQL and web scraping. We also asked a series of questions about how people viewed themselves. So uh, this time we actually did use a, a Likert scale here. Uh, and these are questions like, I think of myself as an entrepreneur, I think of myself as a hacker, I think of myself as a statistician, I think of myself as a jack of all trades. And we did the same NMF process to find in this case uh, four underlying factors. We're not entirely happy with these names, but we haven't found anything better, so please come talk to us later if you've got something better than these. Uh, but for now, we're calling one group uh, data business people. Uh, another group we're calling data creatives in the sort of advertising sense of the word. Another is traditional data researchers. And then the last group is the existing title of data engineers, uh, which here includes things uh, uh, in the software development category. Um, so each respondent then had a higher or lower uh, loading on each of these self-ID ID groups. And so we were able to label each person in our response set with their most highly loaded self-ID group, which was useful for uh, some of the visualizations I'm gonna show you in a second. Uh, so this, this is interesting enough, but you should be asking yourself, do these groupings really reflect the diversity in the community? And I'm gonna show you some data in about two and a half minutes that should give you some reason to think so. So this is a, a simple mosaic plot. It shows how individual respondents fall into the two sets of groupings. Each rectangle is the size of the number of people who shared the same self-ID group across the top and skill group across the left. 
Uh, there's a lot of variety here, but in ways that make sense. So data business people were most likely to excel in business-related skills. Data researchers most likely to excel in statistics. Creatives and engineers were more diverse, uh, but they tended to be the folks who excelled in machine learning, big data sorts of things, and programming. Uh, but those two groups differed in other ways, as you'll see next. So we asked a bunch of questions, what have you done in your life, starting with teaching? Um, and uh, so these two are, have you taught a course or presented work uh, in front of an audience? And most of our uh, respondents have. And uh, it's worth noting from the quality of the presentations last night and probably what you'll see today that many data scientists are good at, at, at speaking in front of audiences because they've had that experience. Uh, we asked about academic publishing. Some people had, particularly in the data researcher group, not too surprising. We asked about contributions to open source software and open data, things like OpenStreetMap, open government projects. Creatives and engineers were most likely to have done the former, and uh, creatives alone were most likely to have done the latter. We asked about business activities, so from left to right, consulting, starting a business, and managing employees. Uh, there's some diversity here, pretty much in the ways you might have expected. Uh, creatives do more businessy sorts of things, it seems, than you might have anticipated. Uh, I'm actually kind of curious to know why maybe creatives work in smaller or different types of organizations, uh, but we didn't ask that specifically. We don't have any data. And then we asked about education. Again, as you'd expect, we're a highly nerdy bunch of people, and uh, MBAs fall in the data business person group. So this slide is worth a second to, to explain. So we asked about the scale of data that people work on, and we found something that we had anecdotally expected which is that most of our respondents rarely work with terabyte or larger scale data. Uh, so if we split by skill group rather than self ID group, which is clear in this particular case, um, you can see from the arrow that the subset that does tend to at least occasionally work with big data um, are the people whose highest skill factor is in that machine learning big data um, category, which makes sort of obvious sense. Uh, Big data is an important aspect of data science, uh, and it's one of the reasons why there's so much excitement about analytics right now, I think. Uh, but it can be a bit of a distraction as well. Uh, I, I want to sort of reiterate that most folks spend most of their time working with small and medium-sized data or aggregating uh, big data to make it small enough to practically analyze. So they're, they're sort of orthogonal types of things. And finally, we asked about jumping on to uh, buzzword bandwagons. So have you ever labeled yourself a data scientist? At least as of earlier this summer, business people were the uh, least likely to have jumped onto that bandwagon, which kind of surprises me. <laughs> so that was a uh, subset of our survey data, uh, illustrating a bit how our different subgroups hold together. And uh, it leads into the next topic, which is from diversity among data scientists to the diversity of skills that individual data scientists uh, have. So there's a theory of how to be effective at your job that says you should be deep in one area and have competence in a wide range of supporting skills. Uh, we like this theory, uh, and we think that in particular, it applies well to folks who do the type of work that we do. In particular, we think that one of the reasons why the data science buzzword has taken off recently is because the tools have advanced so far that a single person can do a huge amount of work that used to require a team to get even started. Uh, so one person can now merge data from all sorts of crazy data sources, uh, visualize it for business insights, build predictive models, and uh, perhaps even deploy it to a production system uh, for other people to use. Now, a team might be able to do more of this more efficiently, but that one person has a good shot of creating a huge amount of data or a huge amount of value all on their own. So are our, our, our respondents T-shaped, you might be wondering? Uh, since we dealt with ranks, we can't answer this ideally, but we, we can uh, make a start on it. Um, so we took those per respondent basis vectors that NMF spit out while identifying the skill groups and uh, sorted them. And then uh, plotted, uh, we're going to plot them. It's not up here yet, but we're going to plot them uh, from the center out on this graph. And uh, ideally, what we'd like to see is the, the, the most high, highly uh, ranked factor here, uh, being very large, down is, is large in this case to make it T-shaped, and the rest of the skills to be more evenly dispersed uh, lower down. And as a control, uh, I randomly simulated the process of people randomly ranking their skills, applied the skill groupings, sorted, and got the pattern in the gray dots. So I'd like to see the actual data look more like the T-shape and less like the gray dots. And uh, 
there's definitely something here in the right direction. So I want to say that at least some data sets do have something like a T-shaped skill set. And uh, this has consequences for individual respondents. So what, what does this mean? It, it might let you describe yourself more clearly and concisely. So if you can describe your depth and your breadth using a shared vocabulary, you might be able to avoid misunderstandings like I talked about before. Uh, secondly, you can look at your own skills and figure out what you should be working on. So you can identify areas of strength that you should be focusing on as your expertise, as well as areas of breadth that will let you do the types of skills that data scientists are being asked to, uh, to perform. And thirdly, organizations can potentially think more clearly about the people that are working with them and what talents they bring to the table and how to assort those. So this graph up here is based on uh, my personal responses to the ranking. I'm not particularly T-shaped. I'm arguably strongest in business schools, uh, skills, which includes software product management. Somewhat oddly, I'm weakest in, in programming skills, and I, I think that's because I don't know anything at all about modern web development, and I ranked it accordingly. Um, and so when I look at this graph and, and think about my own skills, what I see is I might be more effective if I focused a little bit more. Uh, and this is not a new criticism. <laughs> so here's another example. Uh, somebody who's more T-shaped than I am. Uh, this is a, a social scientist with rather good machine learning and hacking types of credentials. In fact, this is Drew, who just wrote a book entitled Machine Learning for Hackers. So that's pretty interesting. Um, OK, I've got a minute left, so to wrap up. Um, so if we dive into that mush that came out of the buzzword meat grinder, we can see some useful patterns. And I showed you some potential new terms uh, for people and for skills that may help us uh, communicate more clearly about who does what. I showed you some data about the variety of people in the category and how they differ. And I talked about, about T-shaped skills and how that framework might be useful uh, for, uh, for data science in particular and for data science uh, careers and to talk about data science teams. And in general, regardless of whether you liked our data and our, our uh, proposals or not, I think there are some implications to this line of thinking that, that we can all agree on based on our experiences uh, talking to people about what we do. Um, there's a lot of miscommunication about the work that individual data scientists do and can do and should be doing. We can definitely do better in that regard. Uh, there are a lot of questions about career development. I get questions from people all the time about what they should be working on to, be, to become more qualified in the field. And we can do better at answering those questions. And there's definitely a lot of wheel spinning going on as talent and problems try to uh, find each other. And I think there are huge opportunities to do better uh, in that, in that uh, last area. So thanks a lot. We'd love your feedback. <laughs>